Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's the point where I feel that applause and feedback and emotion, well, here we've got some applause, uh, it's really missing coming from an audience. Thank you so much for this input, which I believe has taken us right into the heart of patriarchal capitalism or maybe capitalist patriarchy. Maybe it's better to put it that way. And same as in previous rounds, while we're under this impression, we'll move on directly to our forum discussion. And we have three pictures. First, Eva von Redeker. I'd like to welcome her. She is a philosopher and a publicist. There she is. The contested feminist revolt is our topic. So um, there's an academic and a public intellectual in her, and she switches back and forth. She has spent many years at a great number of universities in Germany and in the US. She has taught there. And in recent years, time and again, in her publications about how would I put it, um, possibilities and the future of revolution. She has been part of a lot of public discussions and um, things about what, how the younger generation thinks about future generations and has had an influence there. Currently, she's more strictly scientific. She's a Marie Curie fellow in Verona and works on a project on a phantom possession, amongst other things. And still, I would like to point out her most recent book, if I heard it correctly, in public interviews. She's been calling it her pop book. It's a book called Revolution for Life was published in the German Fischer Verlag publishing house. And it talks about uh, more recent forms of political protests in connection with feminist perspectives of care. It is a critique of capitalism, which gives hope for new forms of a future in solidarity. That's how I'd summarize it very briefly. And I believe that um, actually establishes a very nice link between our two panelists today. So welcome, Eva. We look forward to a short comment from you, a response to Rita's input, which will then allow us to enter into a discussion. And hopefully many of those out there watching and listening to us will take part. Now, before I give you the floor, allow me to make a comment. And I hope that it's already become clear as part of my introduction. Our two panelists. Our panelists that we have chosen, we, because we believe there are a lot of connecting elements between the two. A lot, both of them think in a very general way about the relationship between capitalism and feminism and capitalism and patriarchy. And uh, both of them are doing it in a way that is such, as Rita has just shown us, that it is very freeing, very liberating, also pointing towards the freedom of a future characterized by feminism. Uh, both give rise to hope. Both refer to revolution as a revolution for life. And at the same time, I personally would say I also expect that the discussion will be productive because there are the differences in what the two of you represent, differences that are immediately visible and uh, that will also play an important role in what we'll talk about. I don't know how decisive they will be, but it's really highly interesting because uh, these are two very different feminist perspectives, perspectives that we are confronting with each other now, looking at what it is that you are representing. It's not just the anthropologist and the philosopher, one who uh, is focusing on detail to derive a perspective, and the other uh, who is raising universal questions. 
and has to design these universal questions and um, to look at the difference between the two and to say he's a Latin American feminist. Uh, feminism in the 70s until today is what she's been observing. and. That was always about a feminism characterized by struggle and controversy. And Eva, who as a person really rep embodies or represents a perspective in which feminism uh, has had to strive for the perspective of struggle. So I very much look forward to the links we may uncover, but also to the differences uh, between the two of you that we'll hear about. So Eva, you have the floor with your comment or response. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. I have to say I'm truly grateful and it also have to say it is quite intimidating to get to speak with such an icon of feminism. I'm experiencing an echo, the speaker says. Why don't I turn out turn off or turn down? the output I have here. Can you hear me still, the speaker says? Yes. OK, I believe there's still a bit of an echo. I can't fully get rid of it. Right, well, the, it's just not physical proximity, as Rita Zegato just said. And feel free to interrupt me via the chat if this isn't working. But I'll just keep going for the time being. Now, I believe that this wonderful input that uh, Rita Segato just uh, gave us and that I listened to very intensively, very nicely ties in with the discussion we had this morning. And the reason why I'm so endlessly fascinating by the part of Rita Segato's work that I'm familiar with so far is that, th that it contains a theory of reification and that's what is it is building on. And it is one that does not end or stop at what in Western feminism we know as naturalization, where something is just being described in solid terms. But it is a term of reification that, that is about life and death and appropriation and violence. And it seems to me that this understanding Standing is something that in this term, pedagogy of cruelty, that is this very process of turning something that is living into a thing, this reification via cruelty seems to also touch on something we talked about this morning in our discussion where Ulrike Herrmann and her very instructive um, input talking about uh, England and industrialization and the theory of capitalism that she described and that met with some skepticism because the opinion seemed to be that this goes beyond exploitation of the workers and that it was um, something political factors that brought this into work uh, into the world rather than um, patriarchy itself that it could work without this cruelty so Historically, that's how it evolved. And with Richard Segato, I believe now you can say it's a question that's not being posed in a vacuum. In history, as it unfolded, and capitalism as the accumulation of value and profit, we have always seen an interim step in whatever was being accumulated, what was then put to use as a resource or labor has to be such that it can be appropriated, that it can be used according to people's will, that it has to be killable it, um, so that it can be handled by the pedagogy of cruelty. And she's stressing that um, at a number of points, that we can uh, resist to this accumulation by 
being community-based and being tied to each other, connected with each other in a community-based way rather than becoming uh, things. And these things that she's differentiating between striving for bonds and striving for things seem to represent something like two subjectivizations of which one prerequisite, one is the prerequisite for any accumulation that has a purpose. And this reification or the pedagogy of cruelty is something that she has emphasized today, it has a history, she said. It's not something that a brutality that has no history, uh, something that just exists and has always existed uh, in humankind. It's not as if violence were always being exerted and things taken away. There's a specific history of this pedagogy of cruelty. And that takes me to one of the central themes in my analysis. And Uta, Uta was <laughs> actually asking for, for a bit of a controversy, too. So what is the history of the pedagogy of cruelty? I would suggest that one could say that it is the history of ownership or the form of ownership, the history Based on um, Rita Segato's prior work, I'm familiar with this description or translation of multiple forms of patriarchy, which then uh, turn into a sort of hinge uh, for different forms of patriarchy. And maybe we'd have to emphasize even more strongly that the appro appropriation of um, territory and this type of uh, subjection played a role. And in her presentation today, she really described a different regime. It was a regime of virtualized and maybe datafied appropriation where we're not so much full owners of a subjected domain, but we're rather we're ghost-like individuals who have forgotten their very mortality because uh, they are under an illusion of an image of themselves. And um, in the current current time, that seems to be a type of ownership that's much more abstract than what it was originally um, based on territory or co colonial property. And it is about what is called the age of access or uh, programming and control by um, algorithms and licensing. So that the history of the pedagogy of cruelty quite possibly is closely aligned with the history of ownership. And um, that takes me to the last part, the role of dying or not being able to die. That was an incredibly impressive analysis to say that the problem is we have this stupid disbelief in death. And at the same time, I'm wondering whether the problem is not so much disbelief in death, but rather the necessary fact of ignoring a, a death that we are afraid of. Because, which discharges the, the, the self, because if you view yourself as being the owner, then it you need some death to be something else, something external. And in my work, I uh, speak about the attitude that the subject is modeling in a modern ownership relationship, where ownership is not just owning something or conquering something, but also being able to fully dispose uh, over it to be able to destroy it, something that you have full control over, something that you can treat as if it were without life. And now if I myself 
am threatened by death. If there's a threat that I might die, this undermines my status as, a own, as an owner, which also presupposes that I'm cut off of this object, this clear distinction between the subject and the object uh, that is also part of the striving for things in Rita Segato's um, approach. It, the, it is modeled according to the owner's relationship to their things. And the owner is someone who would always have to see or place death elsewhere, position it elsewhere. So you may, might say the answer to the stupid disbelief in death might be a naive idea of the thought that one were able to control life rather than simply accepting the possibility that one might die, for instance, due to a pandemic, but that such um, pandemic-related politics that we're experiencing currently are such that they use the virus in such a way as to expose the population to death and that those are part of an attempt to try and to continue to allow certain people to continue to believe in their immortality because they see that a death is allowed to rage elsewhere. And that also touches on the thesis of the virus affecting everyone and it um, takes this apart by means of this partial fantasy of immortality, which nevertheless is not true. People can pretend as if they could not fall ill, but of course they can pretend that a death is elsewhere, is happening to other people. And violence or cruelty maybe becomes clearer in it how precarious it is that there's always been a threat of things being finite and that because of that life ha has to continuously be converted into things and because that is not ultimately successful more and more violence is needed to uphold this fantasy and maybe one last comment on a possible counter-strategy. In Rita Segato's work, the positive counter-concept to the striving for things is to strive for bonds. And she's inviting us to say that there are communities, places of community that managed to defend, defend their ties, their bonds, and that those could be a model for uh, politics that protect life. And I'm wondering whether on the basis of this new analysis that is about consistently reifying things, it wouldn't be more accurate to say, or no, let me put it the other way around. From the perspective of the global north, where I happen to live maybe in a small village and where I happen to have grown up on a rural farm, I believe that the communities that we find here are also um, characterized by structures that come from this Western reification subjectivity. And that because of this, additional criteria might be needed to figure out which types of bonds should be chosen. And I'm wondering whether it could be those that uh, do away with ownership or those that are not cruel. But you cannot just leave it at that. The Attraction of cruelty, and that is how Rita Segato's input end, also means that you have to work for life, on behalf of life, and that you have to form other bonds, bonds that are not just neutral vis-a-vis -vis life, but that consistently are regenerated and renew themselves. And uh, maybe that's 
that's what I'd like to inquire about uh, most, that what I'm most curious about, because at some points what Rita Segato said sounded a bit as if every additional degree of abstraction of this ownership relationship uh, makes things worse. The video games, the Zoom communication that is semi-successful in this case now as well. Uh, are things that make um, violence ever more virulent and increase its frequency. And I'm wondering whether we do not have to realize that many of these more abstract ways of communicating might not also allow for a potential to form bonds, a potential that we could tap into in order to counter brutality. So maybe thinking back to original communities who have managed to maintain their identity despite capitalism, and maybe these abstract forms also represent an opportunity uh, of defense or to promote uh, relationships that support life. And that would mean that the history of cruelty is more dialectic after all, and that even in these early stages, uh, there are uh, potentials, for, potentials for feminism as well. Let me apologize for this echo. I would have used my other computer But it was incompatible because of the infrastructure of appropriation. Maybe it sounded worse to you than uh, uh, on our side. I was able to understand you quite well, despite my using a hearing aid and despite the distance. I would like to thank you very much for your response to Rita's lecture. This is exactly in line with my hope of getting to talk to each other and at the same time making different positions quite clear. So I'd like to ask Rita to directly refer to this, the way you heard her contribution, that is, the way in which Eva hears things, saying that property is something which could be at the core of the dispute. This is what really drives the line of argument or that it is forking, for, f forming around. And I could put my way of understanding this next to it. I saw even more on the side of patriarchal capitalism. Rita, more on the side of capitalist patriarchalism. So it was more the patriarchal form of this violent drive that I thought I heard. Maybe you could res respond to this directly, Rita, and then before we throw the floor open for the listeners, we could ask ourselves what the ties we're talking about really has to do with the question for solidarities, which were mentioned right at the beginning of our Congress and which really are part of uh, the basic motives of our feminist discourse. Now, Rita. Well, thank you very much. I would like to make a few remarks, in fact, on the question of appropriation by algorithms. This is what I made a note of. This bi-dimensional appropriation uh, is first of all preconditioned by material appropriation. One doesn't exclude the other. In fact, it rather conditions each other. It's not a co contradiction. Quite on the contrary, so the by dimensional appropriation by algorithms only works, will only function within this history, without within this story of appropriating the world of things. 
I also call it a usurp usurper's attitude of uh, sacking, of appropriating things. The one is the global market. The other thing is smaller local markets as they still exist in my country, for example. And there are still some small places which uh, have very much locally limited markets and market conditions, and we must not mix the one with the other. And apart from this, there is this, we are talking about a system which, of course, is heterogeneous, absolutely diverse. And, in fact, this is the contribution of a Latin American thinker, Quijano. There is this heterogeneous nature, and ultimately a system is something which absorbs all of it, which takes in all of it, all the wealth. But the forms in which we enter into relationships, the forms in which we uh, trade assets in a market, are, of course, extremely heterogeneous. And this is by no means a process which is very much uh, in sync and working in the same direction as we used to think. I'm not a follower of, mono, of monological interpretations, that there's only one perspective which dominates all the others. There is material ownership, material property, and of course there's also a history of appropriation, colonialism and all that. And in fact, this was very important for Europe. Wealth is extracted in this world from the ground, from people, and there's a lot of biologization. The patriarchal form is biologized. This was not the original form of the patriarchal. There's quite a series of theoretical ideas which I could uh, present here, but basically the transition to global modernity, this of course only existed because there was colonialization. There is no modernization without the previous colonization. And everywhere, everywhere where there are but there still are spaces in the peripheries of the continents where they, there still are some indigenous peoples. There is still something left of it. And exactly there, the wealth is extracted from the ground, the rare earths, etc. And here we see that the reification of the world is uh, progressing. I can see this quite clearly in my continent. This process is underway. And at the same time and in parallel, we have this bi-dimensionalization, which has advanced very much. And because of this, we believe that we are omnipotent and immortal. We can see incredibly many video conferences today in which the one talking to us seems to be alive, but actually they're dead. And this is the game of the bi-dimensional, this game of our own mortality. At times I listen to people on screen, and only later on I notice that this person is no longer alive, that only their image is alive in an archive, but the person themselves are lo no longer living, and we often get this kind of thing, don't we? And the other topic, and this is uh, what I noticed when writing my text, I could have gone on talking even longer, and I don't have so much time, and my library is in Brasilia, and I'm in Buenos Aires at the moment. But the thing that uh, anthropologists have been working on for so long. I would have liked to discuss this a bit more as well, meaning what is belief, to put it in this way, a fish 
very much believes in its medium, in water, because it can only live in water. So belief is the firm belief in reality surrounding me. And this reality will characterize my awareness of the world. This is also belief. Not believing in death is also a kind of belief, which is very basic, very fundamental. So if I ask a person, do you believe that you will die? They will, of course, answer yes. But uh, that's not what I mean, this superficial discourse. But do we really treat our bodies as if it was mortal, or do we rather treat it as if it was immortal and invulnerable? And for reasons, and because uh, I would also like to refer to, uh, oh, I can't access a certain book from a British anthropologist I had in mind, as I can't access this, I left this out. But what do we mean by belief? We believe what we feel, and we do not believe in what we do not feel. And what we feel, this of course is also influenced by rational thinking by the mind. There are lots of issues here which we can't really discuss in detail here at this forum, and considering the time we have. However, there is another quite interesting topic. Any regime exists in two ways, in the actual regime and in its antithesis. Each regime has uh, its own negation as intrinsic. I spoke from a, of a foolishness at the beginning, and I was thinking of a tragic anecdote, and at times you have to laugh, that's important, although the story is quite sad. It happened a long time ago, and I hope I remember it correctly, and can tell you via the internet and get it across. There was this newly married Japanese couple on their honeymoon and they went to Kenya for a safari. It went through the papers. I used to live in the UK at that time. And uh, and the Japanese culture had this uh, bi-dimensional, this uh, inclination towards taking pictures earlier than the than the West. And so on that safari, they saw a lion in the savannah. They went, left their jeep to take pictures, and the lion devoured the couple. And this is really this foolish disbelief in, in death. And this is what I wanted to expect in my, to express in my text. This really means being programmed for bidimensionality, that you don't even take into account that somewhere at the end of the world, you could be devoured by a lion. And then the question, how do you change the world? There are quite a few problems, which, uh, in fact, I shed some light on in some of my texts. But uh, I see two issues here. The one is the crisis of moral discourse. It has become impossible today to be heard with moral discourse. This is a fact we have to recognize. If we don't recognize this, we will be wasting our time. One person wrote a question about Guatemala and the violations of human rights there. It's on the chat. The genocide in Guatemala. This is really quite incredible what is happening there. So, in fact, what's happening there is lots of crimes, this genocide in Guatemala. And this barbarism doesn't even reach the hearts of people who read of it or hear of it. It has become something like normalcy in our time. People have got used to considering violence and cruelty as normal. 
And I would have liked to know what it was like in the Nazi period in Germany, whether it was so normal that cruelty had become the mainstream, had become normal. Maybe not because it was hidden, really. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. But nowadays, we see so much on the news, in the papers, in pictures. We see a lot of barbaric behavior. And we are inactive. We remain inactive, just like when thinking of Syria, of Palestine, of the Kurds. And the prisoners living in isolation on an island, we don't even know whether they're still alive. We remain inactive because life has become like this, because history has brought us there, because we humans are like this. Now, this, I, I was wondering whether there would be the time for me to come in without interrupting you. Uh, so now I have to be impolite and I have to say, well, I find it's very good that you have taken us to a more specific approach in this discussion. I can't see the chat function, really. So I would like to ask our backstage coordinators and would like to ask Julia to report on a few questions that were received and that fit in with this point at which we're standing now. Well, at least I hope so. I think there are extremely many questions. I can see them running on the chat function, really many. But most of them are not in Spanish, so I can't read them. So let's ask Julia then. She can read them out to us. Yes, the chat function was really exploding, first of all, with congratulations and thanking for the great contributions. Now, I hope I don't know whether I can really come in at exactly the same point where you're standing, but I have a lot to report on. Many fundamental questions were addressed on the chat function, and I don't want to uh, skip over them. One kind of question was, what do you mean by work for life? And the rego communal, what do you mean by it? That is, in our struggles in everyday life, in contact with life, with the physical, with empathy. How can we find this back? And now being two-dimensional on these screens, is there something like a solidarity of bodies in this digital life? That's the one thing. And then being rooted and the solidarity within the local community has been repeated again and again. It's been said that the Western community is uh, characterized by property. Can there be something like an arraio communal, or is this being made impossible? And then another thing, is it really something good, this intertwining of nature and life? Isn't nature original cruelty? Isn't there a thinking of death which sees it as the possibility of existence? And when we speak of life or revolution, for life, doesn't this reduce us to naked life of Agaben, the disenfranchised life? And back to the studio with this. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I could first of all call Eva to come in. Could I ask you for one comment, Eva, and then Rita could go on. Okay, but I'll be brief. I hope the echo is better now. Great, thanks. Let me say something about life, because this is so fundamental. It's especially the Latin American feminism, which uh, strengthens my courage to make this the center of analysis. I mean, at first of all, it seems amazing when uh, we 
say we are speaking in favor of life when the anti-abortionists are organizing marches for life. But we can clearly distinguish between emancipatory life policies and, on the other hand, authoritarian or even fascist life policies because they make reference to life in different ways. The latter one is always a kind of partial death cult referring to life. So a part of it speaks, it is exposed to extinction or reification so that the way in which it is fenced in, for example, as the patriarchally appropriated reproductive capability of women or as the labor of uh, care work, that uh, it is uh, sort of armored and kept within these spaces. And to me, it seems that the fear that with uh, naked life that you will end up with fascist life policies, this can be dissolved if you're saying, like many feminist critics, criti criticists of Agamemnon say, this never exists. There's either the refied life or the life which really concerns us that we are connected with. So there is no neutral position here. And then universally maintaining and connecting reference to life, that is pretty close to the version which is emancipatory and in solidarity. And this could bring us to the question, how could you be in solidarity through all these remote virtualized channels? But I think we can distinguish. For example, there is a difference between Zoom and Big Blue Button. There is a difference between uh, keeping a distance out of solidarity wearing a mask to be safe in an encounter and the process of working from home, which uh, is in favor of uh, uh, companies so that they can sell off the office space and can speculate. So we can certainly distinguish between these things even when we are using this very global term of life. But now let's hear Rita. I want to hear Rita. Could you answer directly? Before Julia comes with the next package, I would like to take us to one point. I would like to talk about solidarity as a political project, as a feminist political project, as a core interest in our dispute about our possibilities and limits of transnational understanding and the communal shaping of future and justice or not. I would like to remind us of this, but first of all, Rita, could you answer to the bundle of questions presented by Eva? Yes, happily. These are complex questions, that's quite clear. For example, the question of solidarity. Oh, let me put it let, him, let me put it this way. I'm trying to bring about perception and I'm speaking of amphibian ways or an amphibian description of two ways of course this is a very condensed text and trying to condense this into one sentence is difficult, but this amphibian, by this I mean we're trying to be on the one path with one foot and in a different path with the other foot. There are no pure systems, they simply don't exist. So when we talk about solidarity, it's quite clear. Of course it's useful that today we can communicate in this way and can talk to each other, no doubt about that. But there's always this blind spot, I think. We are in a system, we are caught in a system more or less, and of course we can communicate like this if there is no other way at, at the moment. 
but at least I also feel something in the way in which this form of communication, this video conference, is tiring. What hard work it is, it takes much more of an emotional effort to get across. At least my body feels like this. I have to gesticulate much more. I have to stress words much more so that communication is brought about effectively. That's what I mean when I'm saying something is missing. And this blind spot, this blind spot, this is also the path that capitalism is urging us to. But this doesn't mean that there's nothing left to the left or to the right of this path. And it doesn't mean that I'm negating anything else. Be careful. I'm very critical vis-a-vis -vis the monotheist approach in Europe. It even applies to people who don't believe in God. There's just one God. There's just one truth. There's just one beauty. There's only one way of feeling well or of being wealthy. No, that's not correct in this way. There is a para-consistent logic. A and B can be true at the same time. This is a logic which has safeguarded survival for many peoples. For example, for black groups, black people on our continent who say, I'm a Christian, but I also believe in the original African religion or Jamama, the Mother Earth in Latin America. I can do both things. I can believe in both things. And in this way, people can safeguard their survival much more easily. And we have seen this in the 500 years in which we have survived this continuous massacre on our continent. Classical logic says you need to be consistent and coherent. Whereas uh, I come from a logic as an anthropologist where I see different things in many villages and places and observe them. And not everything, it, it's not this all that has been mentioned. So when I focus on one thing, it doesn't mean that other things don't exist or have their meaning or don't work. Concerning solidarity, solidarity, of course, is very fundamental. And I did say that the maxims of the French Revolution, equality, freedom, brotherhood, uh, uh, fraternity, takes, a, take, takes another dimension that's also needed. I think I said this at Sorbonne, that heresy would be another dimension, apart from equality, liberty, and fraternity. Another thing is solidarity, but that's not the same thing. Reciprocity lends us roots, anchors us on sight. Solidarity can come from above, from very high above. We need it. And it's important, and in many situations, it will only enable survival. But what we're rooted in is reciprocity, is exchange. You and me, the both of us, into subjectiveness. And Western philosophy has covered this, has done so for a long time, existentialism and so on. The me and the you, you give me something so that we can coexist. Solidarity and reciprocity are not the same thing. Of course, this would be another exhaustive uh, issue that we can't cover here now, but at least I mentioned it. Then the question whether nature isn't cruel. Well, nature isn't perverted, no, but it is cruel. Because death happening in nature, we see it as something cruel. But the human element that comes in then is perversion, and I would like to distinguish here. Could it be said that a cat is perverted because it plays with a mouse until it's dead or with a little bird? These are issues that you can discuss, but ultimately I believe that humans are bearing this structural psychopathy within them, this cruel narcissism. 
which uh, utilizes the weakness of others unconditionally, perverting this uh, command of masculinity. In nature, we do find the cruelty of life, yes, and the development towards death. But the cruelty of people, of humans, is not the same cruelty as we see it in nature. But quite clearly, this is an issue, and it's an absolutely valid question. How can we get out of that situation? I believe the secret is as follows. Wishes or need something you want to strive for or want to strive for cannot just be done away by a decree. I do not believe in decrees. What I do believe in is a path and changing the wishes, what one wishes for. And I think history will change, the story will change when what we wish for changes, when what we strive for changes, when we can have identified what it is that makes us happy. And that is bonds, it's creating bonds, it's sharing something. So the topic of happiness is central here, and the objectives of said happiness are important. We have to understand how um, a society changes. It will change when it um, can identify ways of bringing about happiness, and these are lengthy topics into which I cannot go in an exhaustive way, of course, now. Oh, aligning myself with the reality of Zoom, I have to say I felt that I, phys I, I almost physically felt that Eva wanted to respond. I really felt it in my body. And I'd like to add one more comment. The way I understand this, solidarity, well, that's not my understanding. Solidarity goes back to the radical theorists of uh, feminist solidarity, back to Bell Hooks or Angela Davis even before that are telling us without reciprocity, there can't be solidarity. So these two really uh, are linked. I'd, co I'd combine those and turn it into one. Uh, Eva, just maybe a brief response from you, if you'd like to, and then I would like to ask Eula for, um, to join us for one final round. Let's just do it before we then conclude this evening. Wow, Ute, thank you for so much empathy. I completely agree with you as regards solidarity. I meant to say the same thing, that I felt the fourth thing that is missing really is uh, the reference to nature and liberating nature and preserving the world. And solidarity is not only something that is reciprocal, it's also focused on meaning. Think of young Marx. And I think I'm, there may be one part where I don't agree with Rita Sigato regarding nature. I would never say that nature was cruel. Maybe it's to do with the translation. There is violence in nature, but there are two um, things that in, as humans we do. So we have um, property and subject and object and assessing something as waste or not waste that you do not have in nature as such. And I agree with that, says Rita. Yes, and you have to you have to fight and, and work to make sure that you have something worthwhile growing. I I, I can see even uh, more contradictions or dissimilarities that I'd love to talk about. But let's open this up one more time for a round with our viewers and uh, listeners. You know, could we have? One or two more questions, questions that you think we can handle. Three? Eva would like to have three. Well, in fact, um, 
the questions that we're seeing submitted here really uh, come down to facts. Um, on the basis of the presentations and the conference itself, uh, we can see that it's also about our very own responsibility, the responsibility every single one of us has, and how we can do justice to this responsibility and what we can do to not uh, feel so powerless. And this powerlessness is also taken up in the question that was asked. Was they were asking this powerlessness that we're feeling and they were, we're seeing. Do you see, think it's going hand in hand with a globalization of pain? So what about this, this powerlessness? And we also want to know how you can feel this global pain, still be able to act locally and to show empathy and solidarity at a global level and to fight for it. So thank you for that and more later. Thank, thank you, thank you, Julia. Now, well, in the end, we'll also talk about the fact that tomorrow we want to look at the world in more practical terms. Today we were fairly relaxed in that we were able to speak uh, about the theory. So you do not have to find exhaustive answers to these big questions. Eva, would you like to get started? Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Now I'm wondering whether this question regarding the powerlessness, feeling of powerlessness, isn't something that is touching on what Rita talked about with trying to, with the idea of omnipotence. I'm actually astonished that there's even something that can be done given just how miserable the situation is. Now, thinking about revolution and social change, thinking that you just have to flip a switch and be able to turn things around and uh, being leftist and globally global we're very weak currently and the question is how can you get organized in such a way everywhere that um, relationships adam chuck change and um, how to handle that which qualities would have to change so that at a minimum spaces that can be defended for the struggle can be created and so that you are able to identify where you reach the limits that you can then uh, work against. So consistently bringing about solidarity, I believe, is the only means against a despair. And to truly have hope, you'd need major uh, social movements where all of this comes together. And as for the second question, again, touching on solidarity and positionality, I believe, ultimately, well, theory and narrative and knowledge is something that is being brought together at this conference. And, and as long as you don't directly identify with the pain of the others, you, where you would be blurring the differences between you and where you equip yourself with a mandate to speak on behalf of victims. Um, but rather you need to reconstruct the mutual relationships and the connectedness, interconnectedness, and including our privileges, our privileged suffering and link it to uh, suffering without privilege. I believe that's the task at hand. And now, to conclude, I believe Rita has already embodied what it, she is known for, being a radical pluralist. Now, I hope that with the last few words that she'll share with us, she'll also allow us to experience the optimism of her will and um, maybe also allow us to hear about um, empiricism in Latin America. Uh, 
I believe the struggle, the fight is happening along all fronts. Now, I may be a feminist, but first I'm a pluralist. I believe there are different types of verticalism. And within feminism itself, there are uh, different strands, as it were. And that's not something that should be employed as politics. There are different paths. And we will only be able to change the world by means of a social movement. So it is important that societal movements and social movements are differentiated. Societal movements are important as long as they're not territorialized. An example, I've got texts here relating to territorial policies uh, or networking. If you're part of my network, I'll respect you, I'll listen to you. However, there's a certain type of verticalism that you'd then have to accept. That doesn't lead to results. Now, we've done this for a long time. And the feminist movement, too, have uh, gotten hung up on that a little bit and were colonized to an extent by this phase in politics. And I believe we have to rethink politics. Our political imagination has to be revived for it is asleep in and I'm part of that. I don't have a crystal ball that could tell me how we can manage to do this. But I believe society, thanks to the many diverse solutions it has, will find the path forward. It will have to be a pluralist path forward. And I just recently decided to speak about horizon rather than about utopia, because Marxism is interpreted incorrectly. We keep thinking that the society of the future will have a predefined format of sorts, that we are capable of ignoring the the passing of time. We have to pre pre be prepared for um, developments keeping surprises for us. And as I said in my text, the social animal is an animal that can change uh, in a completely unexpected way. And it is this unexpected behavior, this behavior that cannot be predicted, that harbors the hope for the future. And this horizon is wide open. I have no idea what that future might look like, because in order to um, predict this future or to define determine or to define the future, you'd be have to be making a mistake that was made before and that has led to failure before. So I believe that this movement of women in the streets has a lot of different characteristics. And I don't have to, the time to go into the details, but man and woman, that's not just two bodies, that's two histories, two stories, one out in the public in fresh air, and the other story is a story that's been playing out in the kitchen, and I believe the kitchen has been taken to the streets, has been occupying the streets, and that's also what happened among us now, and we now have to analyze this politicization. What characteristics does it have? I've uncovered five adjectives. That's not a great number, but thinking about households and their role in politics, we have recognized minorities. We have the universal subject that's been recognized. And although feminists have been saying this for a long time, it's about the white educated men, heterosexual, we're not really sure. At a minimum, he uh, uh, has a family. So we've spoken about um, the criticism of the, regarding this universal subject. But why is it that this minority position is being accepted, being pushed into a corner, being pushed into being part of a minority group that is despised along with other groups? That is what needs to be put to an end. There is no such thing as minorities. There is no such thing as the universal subject. Modern 
colonialism has invented normalcy. There didn't used to be a normal subject before. And that's what we need to break with. And once we've done that, once we've left behind this dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction among women, uh, young girls, once all that comes out, also for transgender people, everywhere, wherever we have something feminine, once that minority really comes bursting to the fore, then maybe then the world will change. And then the patriarchal prehistory of humankind can be put an end. Wonderful. Now, that's what we can share with those who, starting tomorrow at 11 o'clock, will speak about repairing, showing solidarity, uh, going into revolution. Let's have them address address this and let's ask them to consider this and what they'll do tomorrow so i'd like to very much say thank you for your time for all your energy for the bonds that we've allowed been allowed to form and for this wonderful discussion and your input and don't leave us quite yet so again, tomorrow at 11, we'll continue. We have another long, really exciting, interesting day ahead of us. And now allow me to say something about myself. I admit I'm a fan of this digital com game of coming together uh, that's being offered to us by the organizers. I really fully agree with what Rita said. This uh, two-dimensionality is just really uh, boring me, but I have to admit I really enjoyed myself last night as part of this virtual come together on that platform. And in fact, there's even the possibility to withdraw into a separate corner to just gossip, to just talk, just to get to know each other and uh, a way of encountering each other in a different way. So I hope that I'll see all of you soon in the smoker's corner, maybe. So enjoy your evening. Thank you, says Ms. Redeka. Ms. Redeka says, I'd like to thank the interpreters. I would not have been able to follow without them. <laughs> Which says, that's true. We have to say thank you for a lot of things, for uh, the translation, for the technical support, for the wonderful comments, for all the opportunities that we've been given here. I, too, would like to say something, Rita says. I believe it is, in fact, very sad that a great number of the questions could not be asked. Uh, some of them were very uh, detailed, um, carefully worded questions, and we should attempt to uh, provide answers. The people have taken a lot of time, and certainly these things are on their minds. So I'd like to invite the organizers of this conference to do something with these questions and to maybe make it possible to answer the questions later on. Thank you.